Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. Welcome back to the Survival Guide world. And thank you to everybody who watched the One Block at a Time series. Please don't dismiss that series as just an April Fool's thing. We were able to accomplish a whole bunch, so I'd really appreciate it if you folks stopped by and took a look at it. Even if you thought the April Fool's snapshot was just a silly joke, we pull off some pretty bizarre and wonderful stuff in that series, so I hope you'll give it a watch. Anyway, today's episode we're going to take a look at the Drowned, and specifically what you can do to combat the Drowned, because they can be a bit of a menace when you're out here in the world's oceans, and even if you're diving in dripstone caves like we have been over at our dripstone cave base. Now when you're out in the open ocean, it is most likely that you're going to encounter the Drowned around an ocean ruin like this one, although this is the one that's in the lake near my mob farm, so the Drowned here are pretty much long gone at this point. They've all either been killed or just kind of wandered off, I think, but I'm fairly certain that the Drowned that spawn with ocean ruins are typically persistent, so unless you do something about them, they are likely to stick around for a good while. The environment itself may do something about them, though, because they still take damage from magma blocks. But as far as cozy exploration goes, the Drowned can interrupt what might otherwise be a kind of nice little shipwreck dive or your a search of an ocean ruin to get hold of some treasure maps, some magma blocks, or even some sea lanterns, which sometimes spawn in these structures. And while it is ultimately very possible to fight off most of the Drowned, using just a basic sword, the bow and arrow option is a little bit less effective because in water, arrows tend to curve downwards a lot quicker. They have a lot of liquid to contend with, and so you're not really going to find ranged combat all that effective down here, which can be a problem when one of the drowned arrives holding a trident. The solution to that, I would argue, is to get hold of a trident yourself, but that can be a little bit difficult because you won't find these in the average buried treasure chest. You won't be able to craft them yourself or trade them from any of the villagers or the wandering trader. Tridents can only be obtained from the Drowned, and on Java Edition, they can only be obtained from one of the Drowned who is already holding a Trident. Now, on Bedrock Edition, this is a little bit different, because Bedrock Edition folks have the opportunity to get a Trident from a Drowned who isn't even holding a Trident. At least I believe this is still the case. The Trident is part of the Drowned's natural loot table, so there is a small chance of getting hold of a Trident from a Drowned, even if they aren't flinging one at you themselves. But on Java Edition, that is not the case and you'll only be able to get tridents from Drowned who are holding them. The other major difference between Java and Bedrock Edition is that on Java Edition, the Drowned holding tridents drop them a lot less frequently. You can, of course, increase the odds with looting up to looting three, but even then, the chances are still lower than they would be on Bedrock Edition. I think there's about an 11% chance, 11.5% chance, something like that, of getting hold of a Trident from a Drowned in Java with full looting 3 on your sword, whereas on Bedrock it's about 15% as a base drop rate. Which is why Bedrock Edition players typically end up with Tridents a lot more easily than Java Edition players, and it's a good thing too, because Tridents are actually used in automatic kill mechanisms on Bedrock Edition, where some of the methods we use on Java don't work or aren't as convenient. On Java Edition, sadly, so-called Trident killers aren't really a thing, and I'll explain a little bit more about why if we're able to get hold of a trident. Now it looks like we have one trident flinging drowned in the pack here already. I'm going to go for him first because, in theory, it should be a little bit easier to take down the rest of them when we don't have this one in the picture. And you can block tridents with a shield. I tend to try and stay maneuverable, try and strafe at diagonals, and it looks like we didn't get the trident from that one. That's kind of unfortunate. Obviously, it should go without saying that if you're trying to kill drowned out in the wild to get hold of a trident, it's probably a good idea to have Death Strider 3 and Respiration 3 on your boots and helmet, because otherwise you're going to find yourself diving for magma blocks more often than not, just to replenish your air supply. <laughs> but as you can see, despite us taking on that whole ruin's worth of drowned, we haven't ended up with a trident, because unfortunately, we have to take on the trident-wielding drowned in order to get one. And to add a further complication, you can't just end up converting a bunch of drowned from a zombie spawner in order to get hold of tridents. It simply doesn't work that way. Drowned who are converted from zombies do not hold the type of equipment that you find naturally spawned drowned holding, and that is tridents included. But that small chance for any drowned, not just one holding a trident, to drop a trident is the reason that those kind of farms work a lot better on Bedrock Edition than they would here on Java Edition. But I hear the familiar flinging sound of a drowned with a trident Let's see if we can get it on our second try. This is with looting three on my netherite sword, of course. We're going to have to defend ourselves a little bit here against the flinging of the drowned. 
Looks like no trident for us. Unfortunate. And while you'll find the trident sprite stuck in a block like this, unfortunately, we cannot sword in the stone this. We cannot pull it out by hand. You cannot collect them if they've been thrown by the drowned. Think of them like skeleton arrows. You can't pick arrows from skeletons up from the ground. You can't do the same with tridents that the drowned have flung at you. Otherwise, trust me, trident farms would be a lot easier. <laughs> Speaking of trident farms, we're not going to get to them in this episode, but there are some really interesting ways of farming tridents, and some of the changes they've made in Minecraft 1.18 are going going to be pivotal to the way we design a drowned farm in this update, so I'm very curious to see how that's going to work out a little bit later on in the series, but for now, I'm pretty committed to finding my first trident by scouring the oceans and rivers and dripstone caves and taking on the drowned hand to hand. And when we don't find a drowned with a trident, collecting a little bit of buried treasure as a consolation prize. <laughs> But in the meantime, if we wanted some help turning the tide against this underwater menace, there is somebody we could call. Pop down to your nearest lush cave and you'll typically find one of these critters swimming around inside the water pools and probably leaving a lot of dead tropical fish in its wake. This is an axolotl, which we can scoop up in a bucket of water the same way you can a fish. And this will actually net you an advancement, which I believe is somewhere in husbandry. Yes, there we go. The cutest predator for catching an axolotl in a bucket. I already happen to get this advancement on a more recent live stream, so I've already got that one. But there are a couple of other ones which lead off from this, we have the healing power of friendship to team up with an axolotl and win a fight, implying that axolotls can more or less help you in fights against aquatic foes. And this genuinely is the case, because <laughs> if you take a couple of axolotls into a fight against something aggressive like a drowned or a guardian, they will help fight alongside you. We're also going to grab a bucket of tropical fish, because this is the axolotl's preferred food. They are bred and they are led by buckets of tropical fish, and so if we want to breed them, we might actually need to get two tropical fish from here in our lush cave. So back here at our dripstone cave, where we can take a slightly better look at them, because of conduit power, we should be able to release our axolotls and they might even be able to help us fight the drowned down here. Because axolotls will target hostile mobs underwater and if this axolotl actually notices there's a drowned around, we're going to be able to hopefully win a fight against it. Now, it's obviously a little difficult to avoid hitting the axolotl when you do, but if you help the axolotl win a fight like so, there you go, the healing power of friendship. And the name of this advancement also alludes to the fact that if you take damage during that fight, an axolotl is actually able to imbue you with a very short burst of regeneration, which actually stacks for the amount of axolotls you have in a fight, or at least the time of the regeneration effect stacks rather than the regen effect itself. It doesn't leave you with like regeneration 4 or anything, but it does give you regen 1 for up to 2 minutes, which if you ask me is a pretty cool mechanic. Now we can pop this axolotl back in the bucket as long as we've got a bucket of water handy, and the axolotl in the bucket will retain its color and everything. So if I put down this other axolotl that I picked up, this one is going to be the white one with the purple and pink, and I really love the look of this axolotl. I think it's probably my favorite coloring. You can also find yellow ones and pink ones out there in the wild. The ones you will not find are a rare blue variant, and those can only be acquired through breeding. So if we get our buckets of tropical fish, which I'm pretty sure the axolotls will be drawn towards if I'm holding them nearby, so hopefully they should decide to swim on over. If I feed one bucket of tropical fish to this one and another one to the brown one, wherever it ended up, there we go, they have a very, very small chance of producing a blue baby. And of course these ones aren't going to do it because I think the chance is about 1 in 1200. It's, yeah, 1 in 1200 is a very, very small chance. But the baby axolotl that they produced can be bucketed up as well and will remain a baby until we release it for long enough that it can grow up. So if we wanted to start an axolotl breeding program in order to obtain that rare blue axolotl, then we could do. And it would take us a very, very long time. We'd probably end up doing that in a lush cave because that's a place that you could easily obtain lots and lots of tropical fish, but it would be a bit of a grind. Obviously, as Minecraft players, we are no stranger to a grind, and once you produce a blue axolotl, then any of the offspring of that add another axolotl would have the possibility of being blue as well. So once you've got one, you can breed a whole army of blue axolotls if you want to. Now, one thing you need to remember about axolotls is that if you see them on land, they don't want to stay there because axolotls will take I don't know if it's suffocation damage, technically speaking, but it's something along those lines if they're out on land for 
for a long time without access to the water. Now, sometimes you'll see them just getting up onto land, especially if they're following you with a bucket of tropical fish, but beyond that, they will typically try and get back in the water after a certain time. Otherwise, they'll start to take a few points of damage. And at that point, it might be a good idea to scoop them up in the water bucket once again to make sure you can preserve them. But if you wanted to fight some of the drowned and you wanted a way to get the upper hand in a fight like this, you could unleash a few axolotls and while they would still take a little bit of damage, they will help you take on the drowned. Every so often, once an axolotl receives a bit of damage, they will play dead for a few seconds. At that point, the hostile mobs will stop targeting them, and while it hasn't happened in this fight, they can give themselves a short burst of regeneration. As you could see from that fight, it wasn't quite enough to save the axolotls because one of them did end up dying in the attacks of that drowned. But it goes to show that maybe axolotls aren't necessarily something that you should get to attach to if you're planning on using them in combat situations. Because while they have the means to preserve themselves, they're not invulnerable, and they will end up taking fatal damage in certain circumstances. Throughout all of this, one of the places you may find axolotls most useful is here in rivers, where they will passively farm squid for you. You. Naturally, since the squid can't exactly fight back, having axolotls be able to damage them is kind of a useful mechanic for passively farming ink, and the axolotls are fast enough that they'll be able to catch up even when the squid are swimming away pretty quickly. <laughs> There we go, we got our first piece of ink farmed for us by an axolotl, and if we were able to contain the axolotls and squid in an area, we would find that they were pretty effective at farming the squid. Although axolotls do give hostile mobs priority, and when they kill a non-hostile mob like a squid, it does take a couple of minutes for them to cool down before they go and target another one. So if you're planning on farming squid this way, you probably want to bring a variety of axolotls with you so that the next one will go ahead and attack the next squid as quickly as possible. Perhaps most interesting Interestingly, axolotls can be used to combat guardians in ocean monuments. Where do I need to swim? Do I need to swim up? Yes, here we go. So if I release a few axolotls in here, they will actually help you attack the guardians inside an ocean monument. And it's probably best to keep track of them if you want them all to swim around you, so bringing a bucket of tropical fish is probably pretty good in this regard as well. Now, this is an ocean monument that I've raided before. There is no core in here, and so you'll find that there are no Elder Guardians either, but Axolotls have the ability to remove mining fatigue from the player if you help them win a fight against another hostile mob. So if I was to take down this Guardian with the help of these Axolotls, which are going to swim outside, so they're probably going to get targeted by the other Guardians pretty quickly and ultimately end up getting killed. There you go. We can see this one playing dead. The other Guardians aren't targeting it. It's getting a little bit of those regeneration particles around it and eventually, having healed a couple of hearts, it will be back in the fight. Although it's not a fight it's going to win, against all of these guardians out here. But as I was saying, axolotls will help you win a fight against an Elder Guardian because they can remove the mining fatigue effect that the Elder Guardian applies, allowing you to break your way through the walls of this ocean monument and potentially get a little bit of air. Now back to our original question. How helpful are axolotls when it comes to the fight against trident-wielding drown? Now as before, if you spam axolotls nearby, you're probably going to have a slightly easier time taking on this trident-wielding drowned. However, axolotls are going to take a lot of damage from any drowned with a trident and unfortunately they're not going to be able to deal a great deal of damage in return. So as far as helping us get a trident goes, unfortunately it's going to end in tragedy for a lot of the axolotls that we bring around here. They're just not powerful enough or hardy enough that they can survive something so fierce. And attacks from the drowned are ultimately why most axolotls end up dying because typically people will make tanks for them in ocean biomes, river biomes or even dripstone caves and that's what ends up with the axolotls getting killed most of the time. So if you enjoy these cute little critters, it's probably best to keep them in a passive mob farming context the way that you can with squid farms, maybe even glow squid farms if you're interested in setting up one of those. And we're going to continue exploring the world here, fighting all of these drowned solo in the hopes of getting our first trident. Regardless of whether or not I get the trident from this guy, he just took out a phantom with it. <laughs> I think he actually one-shot a phantom with this trident, and I can't believe I'm getting attacked by both the drowned and phantoms at the same time. Looks like no trident for us. Yes! 
Finally! Oh my gosh, <laughs> that took a while and a lot of drowned, but we have a trident. Unenchanted, a lot of damage on that one, but I think we can make it work. Nothing a bit of unbreaking and mending can't fix. Let's head on home. Before we go though, shout out to this cave. This cave is so far down and even during the day when there was full sun and the first few layers of water just wouldn't spawn drowned because of the light level restrictions on mob spawning, coming down into this cave and getting as far down as possible, we're at like Y negative 20 or so, yeah, like 26, 27, loads of drowned spawning in here. So honestly, if you're out looking for a drowned spawn in the wild and you want to get hold of a, a bunch of drowned nice and easily, this cave is a really good place to go. I mean, this cave, like a cave like this specifically, should set you right. It's also a really good place to look for ores because I managed to find a bunch of diamond ore that's obviously not exposed to the air because the cave is completely flooded, but we got ourselves a bunch of diamond and deep slate diamond ore just from looking around in there. We have glow squid ink, we have a bunch of nautilus shells and copper from the other drowned. I think this was a pretty successful trip. It just took ages to find the right place, but I think I'm gonna be back here now. And of course, the biggest problem problem with getting hold of a trident is that you automatically want a second one, because tridents have four unique enchantments you can put on them, and a couple of them are mutually exclusive, meaning that they cannot be put on the same trident. So we're going to throw this into the enchantment table, we get unbreaking three, so a bit of a potluck here, but I've got 31 levels, might as well give this a try now, we can always visit the XP farm if we need to. Yeah, we just got on breaking three. I kind of saw that coming, actually. <laughs> and now loyalty three is coming up in the enchantment table, and this is an interesting one, because loyalty effectively turns your trident into something like Thor's hammer. If you throw it, it will return to you automatically. As long as you've got an empty space in your inventory, the trident will just shoot back towards you. But that is mutually exclusive with another enchantment called Riptide. And what Riptide does is allow you to propel yourself up into the air or through through the air if you start off in water or if it is raining at the time, meaning that you can transport yourself through water very fast if you're using Riptide. Unfortunately, if loyalty is coming up in the enchantment table, there isn't really a chance of us getting Riptide on this trident. There is, however, a chance of getting hold of channeling, and I don't know if I have a channeling book in here. It is something you can get from the enchantment table on books. It isn't necessarily a treasure enchantment in the same way that mending or soul speed would be, but channeling allows you to strike things with lightning you using your trident if there is a thunderstorm happening at the time. So a lot of the trident's powers are related to the weather, whether or not it is raining or whether it is thundering, you'll be able to get the most out of your trident at those times. But a trident can still have some use as an offensive weapon. It's got a pretty decent attack speed, you can use it like a sword, you can kind of swipe at things with it, but for the most part it is best when thrown. So I think maybe we're going to go with this loyalty enchantment after all, and in a future episode we'll be able to come back and get another trident to get hold of Riptide. First of all though, we need to take a quick trip to the end to make sure that I can top up on XP at the Enderman farm. There we go, with 39 levels we're feeling a lot more comfortable, and let's throw this in the table to see if we get... Oh, we got Unbreaking 3 on there as well. Okay, not too shabby. That means we can skip putting the Unbreaking 3 book on it, we can put Mending on it, and I'm looking around to see if I have any other books that are related to the Trident, because there is one more enchantment we could put on this besides channeling, which will give it the edge in combat. And after a few test enchants, that one isn't coming up in the enchantment table, so I might pop over to my villagers and see if they have it. Well, it turns out they don't have it, and in fact, they have kind of the opposite. This librarian here has a Riptide book, but what I'm looking for is a book called Impaling. Impaling is like sharpness for tridents, but it only works on aquatic mobs, so fish, squid, glow squid, axolotls, that kind of stuff, but also guardians, most importantly, because guardians are the only hostile mob that technically counts as aquatic. I guess elder guardians are also counted in that, but even the drowned are technically classed as undead mobs, and so Impaling doesn't do extra damage to the drowned. So Impaling is not exactly a priority enchantment on Java Edition. On Bedrock, however, things are a little different. Impaling works on any mob which is standing in water, and that even includes when it is raining. So much like Riptide working in the rain, Impaling works on mobs when they're just standing out there in the rain, making the Trident a much more lethal weapon when it is raining, or when whatever hostile mob you're trying to attack is in water. And so the accessibility of Riptide books here at the village has got me thinking 
maybe we should go for Riptide instead of Loyalty and Channeling, because we've done a bit of experimentation with Lightning already, and honestly, Lightning is still a little bit easier to control if you have a Lightning Rod. But Riptide, on the other hand, can be something really cool to play around with, and so I think maybe we are going to buy two Riptide books, and we'll have a go at enchanting this thing one more time, this time aiming for Riptide. And of course, channeling is coming up in the enchanting table. Well, not to worry. We're going to combine these two Riptide books. We're going to spend six levels on that to start off with. We're going to combine Riptide and Unbreaking and then add Mending to that for another five levels. Let's see how much it's going to cost to put it all on the Trident. Another visit to the Enderman farm seems on the cards. And now after cycling the table one more time, Impaling is coming up as an enchantment, and we just get Impaling on its own, which allows me to demonstrate that Impaling and Riptide are not mutually exclusive, but Riptide changes the throwing of the Trident. Basically, you can't throw the Trident anymore. Instead, you kind of use it to charge at enemies, and Impaling can still affect the damage that you deal with the Trident. You can also still use it as a melee weapon. You just can't throw it away from you the same way you could a Trident with loyalty and channeling. Now we're going to spend the 18 levels to uh, turn this Trident into a Riptide Trident. We've also got Unbreaking and Mending on there, so we can go out and gather a little bit of XP to mend this thing up as well. And now with the trident all fixed up, I can really show you what Riptide can do. Because instead of throwing it like the Drowned do, we're going to take to the water and we're going to charge up the trident in our hands and propel ourselves forward. Now it looks a little bit awkward with the shield there, so let me show you that without the shield for a second. You basically kind of charge through the water and if you hit anything on the way, you deal pretty massive damage to it. In the case of these fish, they're also being affected by the impaling enchantment, and that means they die pretty quickly. The same will be true of the squid over here, and we can just boost ourselves towards them a couple of times, one hit, and the squid is down. And that we can use to potentially get up close and personal with some glow squid if we want to get hold of more of this glow ink, which is really useful for making the text on signs more visible and creating glow item frames. In combination with the dolphin's grace effect we're getting from these dolphins, we can travel pretty fast in the water with Riptide, but that's not all. We can also use Riptide to take to the air. If I come up to the surface here, I can activate my elytra like so, just by tapping the space bar as I come to the surface of the water. And then by holding the trident back and letting it go, we can actually launch ourselves up into the air. And Riptide allows you to launch yourself out of the water like this with this kind of spiral effect as you go. But if you end up skimming the surface of the water with your wings open like I just did, the water doesn't necessarily interfere with your momentum as you leave, and that can mean you get to some pretty outstanding takeoff heights. If you want to preserve fireworks, if you're running low on them and you don't have a mob farm set up yet, Riptide can be a really useful way of taking off from the surface of the water. Even if you've got a single water source, you can do stuff like this, and it will allow you to glide around without having to spend so much of your resources making fireworks. Even without the elytra equipped, it is still possible to use Riptide to leap out of the water, although I will give you the proviso that you should be worried about where you land because it's possible to get pretty high up with Riptide and if you don't have Elytra to catch you, you can end up taking some pretty serious fall damage. Luckily, Feather Falling on your boots is probably going to avoid the worst of that, but even so, best to keep your eye on where you're using Riptide and make sure you've got Elytra on you if you want to be sure of a safer landing. Where Riptide really comes to life though is in the rain because you can launch yourself in the rain the same way you can if you launch yourself out of water, but it's possible to boost yourself in the air flying with Riptide and Elytra like so, and you could even do that without Elytra if you were brave enough, so if you want to just keep propelling yourself through the air like this, it's certainly possible to do, it's gonna take a little bit of a right-click spam, but you can stay aloft for quite a while before inevitably you come back down to Earth. It's a little bit kinder in first person without a shield, but you really do feel incredibly powerful flying through the air like this, and you can pick up some very, very high speeds, I think faster even than the propulsion you get from fireworks this way. Of course, you still do need to watch the durability on your elytra when you're doing that, and every use of Riptide has a chance of knocking a durability off your trident, obviously lessened with Unbreaking 3 in effect. As I mentioned, the trident is still an offensive weapon as well. It does a pretty decent amount of damage, about equivalent to that of a diamond sword, although, as I mentioned, on Java Edition, this effect isn't increased in the rain with Impaling, whereas it can be on Bedrock Edition, and I might be one-shotting these zombies right now if it worked the 
same way. It's effectively like sharpness that's only active when it's raining. But having a Riptide Trident is super fun to play around with, and once we get hold of another Trident, we should hopefully have a crack at channeling and loyalty as well. But for now, that's going to be where we leave this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you've enjoyed taking a look at Tridents with me, and I hope you enjoy tracking one down in your own worlds. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been PixelRefs. Don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you.